This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on financial statement analysis and the reading on financial reporting standards. This is the second big picture reading that we've looked at inside of this study session, but it is extremely important because like the first reading, it's going to give us a foundation under which we are much more prepared to be able to handle the more detail-oriented readings that sound like, hey, let's make sure you know everything about the balance sheet. Let's make sure you know everything about the income statement and so on. Now, this reading in particular focuses on standards, financial reporting standards. And let me give you two extreme examples. Let's suppose that I'm Jim and that I am looked upon as the expert in financial reporting standards. And I say to all of the accountants out there working in public accounting and working for these corporations, I say something like, hey, whatever you want to report, feel free to report it under any kind of methods and assumptions that you feel like reporting. Let's call this Jim's Anarchy Reporting Standards. So the problem with that, of course, is that you would look at a set of financial statements and you would have no idea whether or not to believe them. But let's go to the other extreme. Suppose I'm Jim once again and I say, look, when you guys put together these financial statements, I want you to put in every single detail about that organization, about that corporation, about that company. I want every single uh inventory audited. I want every single accounts receivable uh, evaluated. I want every piece of in information. Well, for those investors interested in evaluating that corporation, they'd get a document that would be a million pages long. And so that's no good. So of course, once again, financial reporting standards rely on that basic tenant that we learned back in microeconomics, marginal costs and marginal benefits. What we want is a set of standards that are reasonable. And that's what we're gonna be focused on during, uh, during this slide deck. Now, I wanna make a comment on the 15 questions that the Institute puts at the end of the reading. And these are clearly just definitional in nature. In fact, a handful of them, you would already be able to answer based on what we did in that first reading. For example, there's a question that sounds something like, which of the following accounts would be on a statement of performance? And of course, the two answers would be revenues or expenses. And I think expenses is the correct answer on this example in the back of the chapter. But my point is that these are relatively straightforward multiple choice questions at the end of this reading. But clearly, you need to know definitional terms and you need to understand what I was saying about marginal costs, marginal benefits, and financial reporting standards. So let's look at the learning outcome statements. And so note that these are all action words that tell us to describe. And so what we're going to do is describe this set of standards. Let's go back to Jim's example, the set of standards that is, is reasonable, right? So look at some of the words inside of these LOSs, objectives, roles, uh, qualitative characteristics, general requirements. All right, let's take a look at this uh, this first one and look in the purple box. We have we have a question. I think we had this question in the previous reading as well. Why are financial statements so important? Well, as good financial analysts, as good level one candidates, you already know this answer, at least in general terms. And the answer is, well, because so many people use them. Here we go. Who uses these things? Uh, all sorts of stakeholders, right? The supply chain people, right? Creditors, bankers, bondholders, shareholders. And then on the bottom right, of course, you can't forget about, about the government. The government is also interested in those financial statements. And so I'm going to summarize all this here for you in just one word or two. The most important reason that financial statements are so important is because we, as good financial analysts, use them to, here's my word, to value the company's securities, whether those securities are fixed income securities or whether they are equity securities. We use these to assign, to estimate a value. 
Now, why are they necessary? Okay, this is you know kind of a linked question, but it's a little bit different. They're necessary because as good financial analysts and as good investors, all the people out there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and the New York Bond Exchange, when they look at financial statements, they want to see some kind of consistency. They want to see some ability to compare between and among different firms, which means they want a financial statement that looks pretty similar. So if you pick up, I think in that last reading, we, we had uh, some financial statements from Nike. If you pick up the Nike financial statements and then you pick up the Under Armour financial statements, you want them to pretty much look the same. So you can say, oh, here's total revenue and here's total revenue for these two companies and we can make a direct comparison against the two. Now, let me swing back here and say, all right, all of these groups uh, down at the bottom, they, of course, scour these financial statements for information what that means then is that they're hoping that that information is transparent. In other words, that what's shown on the page reflects the reality of the operations of the business. Now, what transparency and comparability and consistency do is they strengthen accountability, right? So if we look at a bunch of financial statements that are put together by the accountants inside of those companies who play along with here, let me go back to here, who play along with the rules and regulations outlined by the accounting industry, well, then, whoops, I keep flipping around, sorry. Uh, then this is going to improve the efficiency, maybe not of the entire economy, maybe will, but uh, clearly this is going to have an impact on things like liquidity, on things like what goes on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, how easily it is for the ratings agencies to assign uh, default risk level on bonds, comma, and et cetera, et cetera. I could list uh, thousands, uh, thousands of reasons why financial reporting standards are necessary. Now, who are the people out there who set these regulations? In my first example, I was just Jim, right? I'm just a regular old uh, finance professor. I probably don't want to be the one setting the rules for all of these accounting and financial reporting standards. And so these are typically uh, nonprofits, they're probably self-regulated, which of course, as good CFA candidates, we're all in favor of self-regulation because of all of those professional standards and ethics that we go through in one of those initial uh, study sessions. So notice that second uh, embedded bullet point in there at the top. These members consist of experienced accountants and auditors and users of financial statements. And wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm one of those people there at the end, an, an academic. But clearly you'd much rather have uh, someone with a PhD in accounting and who is a CPA rather than uh, me setting all these rules. Now, of course, there are two main bodies that do this, the International Accounting Standards Board and the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And so the big difference between the two is that FASB, of course, is centered in the United States and the International Accounting Standard Board headquarters are in, uh, are in London. And so that's kind of a global organization. So notice that first bullet point there, International Financial, Financial Reporting Standards reflects uh, diversity in different types of professions and geography throughout the globe. Uh, look at that bottom one. They deliberate, they develop and issue um, these standards with the help of advisory bodies. Now compare that to the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which does this all inside of the United States. And this is what produces the US GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. And so I wanna give you an example, and maybe this will help in terms of answering a question on the exam about the difference between these two organizations. Uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board is generally a, a rules-based system while the international board is a principles-based system. And for those of you who are uh, basketball fans, I'm gonna give you my example of the difference between rules-based and principle-based. Uh, 
Um, I'm guessing that if you're a basketball fan, you watch the NCAA tournament, you watch the NBA playoffs. And so one of the most difficult calls for referees to make is the charging call. And my son and I, we cringe every time there's a collision on the court. And my son says something like, that ref has no idea what to call when, uh, when it's either a charge or a blocking foul. But here's, here's what FASB does. Here's what we've done in the NCA and in the NBA. We have made a rule. We've drawn like a half circle right outside the basket. So in order, in order to take a charge, the player has to be outside, has to be outside of that little half circle. So that's a rules based. You can't call a charge unless the defensive player is outside of that semicircle. The international rules are principle-based and they kind of would be outcome. And so the rule would be, they wouldn't need that. They wouldn't need that semicircle. They would just tell the refs, make sure that you call it fairly so that there's a fair outcome. And so you have all these clashes. And if you're playing in the NCA, you might be a charge. If you're playing in Europe, it might not be a charge. And that's pretty much the difference uh, between these two organizations. So just remember rules-based versus principle-based. And so what that means is that they're going to disagree on some kind of standards. Now, it's not going to be as dramatic as I explained in the, uh, in the basketball example, but, but there are differences. But here's really the good news is that these two bodies are trying to do this. They're trying to converge. So you might see that word on the exam. They're trying to converge so that so that the two systems are as closely related as possible, given the difference between what has gone on in the US and what has gone on outside of the United States. Um, all right, what did I say earlier? The government is always interested in what businesses are doing. And of course, what countries have done is establish regulatory authorities. And what they do is they say, okay, we, we agree that these international or US organizations, not-for-profit organizations, they, they're experts, they pretty much know what they're doing, but let's go ahead and make sure that we enforce these rules. So in the US, we have the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. And historically, what the SEC does is it just enforces the rules established by these bodies. But also, I mean, a lot of times these have become laws in Washington. And so the SEC is in charge of, you know, keeping track of what's going on inside and outside of corporations. And of course, when you think of the SEC and, uh, you know, and rules and regulations, you know, you might think of uh, companies like Enron, which uh, violated all different sorts of rules and regulations and laws. And so there was a court date and, you know, there was a guilty verdict, et cetera, et cetera. And right, I'm not sure how terribly important uh, knowing about the International Organization of Securities Commissions is, with the exception of that middle part there. But before I get to that, let's go ahead and remind ourselves, you know, formed in 1983, and it has a bunch of members throughout the world. And what it does is it regulates a significant part of financial markets. But here are the core objectives, and I think this is, this is the most important part of this LOS protecting investors, reducing systematic risk. And, you know, I would put in parentheses here as part of Jim's editorialization in, in the slide decks. Oh my gosh, it's super hard to, to uh, reduce systematic risk. And in fact, some investors like lots of systematic risk. Nevertheless, what the reading and what this uh, IOSCO is responsible for is making sure that the systematic risk as measured by things like beta, that systematic risk of a company's share of stock reflects the actual volatility inside of the market and doesn't reflect uh, stuff that goes on outside of the market. That could be a violation of all these rules and regulations. So that's what that second part means. And then I love that third one, ensuring that the markets are fair, efficient, and transparent. And those principles are divided into 10 categories. You can read those, but I think those three core objectives are important.
Uh, how about the SEC? Of course, the SEC is a member of that international organization. And what the SEC does, it has laws, reporting companies, brokers and dealers, market participants, and there are a bunch of rules and regulations and laws, you know, going back to uh, uh, the Securities Acts and after the Great Depression, or during the Great Depression, this was after the stock market crash. And then uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, this was after, you know, Enron and Global Crossing and all those uh, firms that essentially faked us out when they put together their financial statements. And so essentially what, what the SEC does and what Congress does here in the United States is put together a series of laws and regulations that are going to promote all the things that we've been talking about so far in this slide deck accountability and transparency and, and honesty. And you know, I tell my students this all the time, and this is parenting advice that I give my children. I say, I say, look, you either have integrity or you don't. You get to pick if you have integrity. Now, when you take this upcoming test, now's a really good time to practice that level of integrity. And I tell my children, look, if you have integrity in small things, then you're probably going to have integrity in big things uh, when, when you get older. And so what these governing bodies and what the CFA Institute is trying to do is trying to say the exact same thing that I'm saying. There's, look, look, you can cheat, you can be dishonest, but what fun is that? Well, comma, maybe there's lots of fun in that, but sooner or later, hopefully sooner or later, uh, you know, you get caught or you feel guilty or something. This is not the way to live. So if you have integrity, well, then let's go ahead and practice as good financial analysts with high levels and high degrees of integrity. Do I sound like your parent? I'm, I'm sorry if I, uh, if I launched on that. Uh, how about capital markets regulation uh, over in Europe? Oh, so each EU member regulates the capital markets in, in France and in Germany and in Italy. And so what they agreed to do is adopt the standards by the IFRS. And so there are these other commissions that are throughout the world, European Securities Commission. And so they do pretty much the same thing as the SEC does in the United States. And then there are some other authorities that have supervision, you know, kind of inside of stock and fixed income markets in a country, but also they, they do some cross-border supervision because, of course, we know that shares of Amazon stock can be traded here in the United States, they can be traded uh, in Canada, they can be traded in Europe. Heck, I'm sure Santa's stock exchange, if such a thing exists, trades shares of Amazon stock. So there has to be somebody who's in charge of keeping track that if you go to the North Pole and you want to buy shares of Amazon, that, that you don't get cheated or that you have access to all that information that's relevant. All right, what about these international standards, this conceptual framework? So look at that question that we have in the blue box. What is this all about? All right, so it outlines these concepts for presenting the financial statements to the external users. And these diamond points here are really just a summary of what I was saying earlier. What do you want? When you compare the balance sheet and the income statement of, what did I say, Nike and Under Armour, you want to be able, you want to be able to compare those. You want to be able to make reasonable conclusions based on those two sets of financial statements. So here's this conceptual framework. Well, when you put together a framework, you want to set the standards, you want to develop the standards, and you want to constantly review them. You want to help preparers of financial sta statements dealing with issues that are specifically not covered by a standard. Remember what I said earlier when I gave you the example of Jim's standard of, I want every piece of information in there. Well, we're not going to be able to cover every single part of that. And so how do the accountants deal with something when, you know, let's suppose they're an accountant for a farm that is growing honey crisp apples. And here's a honey crisp apple that's in perfect condition. And here's a honey crisp apple that has a little brown spot on it, right? Maybe a worm got in there or maybe some ants are eating. You know, do you value those in, in the same way? Do you throw this one out? Do you call that waste? Do you, do you, I mean, there are all sorts of things that are not specifically outlined in the standard. 
And then, of course, we're going to be able to help the auditors form an opinion. Remember in that last reading, we talked about the qualified opinions and the unqualified opinions and all those kinds of opinions. And then finally, what does that last diamond point say? Assist users in interpreting financial statement information. All right, why do we need this conceptual frame it, framework? Look at what you have there in bold. Consistent standards, right? What is the objective? Useful to both current and potential providers in making, uh, making financial decisions. Of course, a bank has to uh, determine whether or not it wants to lend a huge amount of capital to Amazon. Bondholders, same thing. Shareholders want to decide whether they should participate in an initial public offering. Shareholders want to know if they should participate. Are you ready for this one? We'll hit this one sooner or later in the CFA program. If they want to participate in a stock market repurchase. Huh? What if a firm repurchases its shares? You're a good financial analyst and you have a whole set of clients who may decide to tender their shares, whether it's an open market repurchase or a fixed price self-tender offer. Boy, we have tons and tons of fun stuff to talk about uh, over the next months in all of your studying. All right, I bet you know the answer to this. Qualitative characteristics of financial reports. Two fundamentals, relevance and a faithful representation. So we talked about this, and I tell my students this regularly. I say, you know what? Here's a problem on the exam. I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff that you need, and I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff that you don't need. And it's your job to sift through to find out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. Because sooner or later, when you guys grow up and get jobs, I'm talking about my students, you're going to have a supervisor who says, Here, here's a project. I want it by five o'clock tomorrow. And you're going to have to determine what is relevant and what is irrelevant. But it, what's really important for the Institute and for an exam question, look over there on the bottom right of that beige box. The information is probably going to be relevant if it has predictive value or if it confirms a value or perhaps both. So remember, I said this a little bit earlier, I used the term value. So relevance means value, right? So potentially influences the decision of the users. And this has everything to do with resource allocation. And then faithful representation. What does that mean? Complete, neutral, oh, oh. This is a great exam question. Somewhere in the question stem, it says something like, oh, this account accountant is biased, <laughs> you know, biased in some way. Maybe the accountant, let's go back to my honey crisp apple. Maybe the accountant says something like, you know what, that honey crisp apple that it's bruised, I'm gonna throw it away and I'm not even gonna report it as an uncollectible <laughs> accounts receivable or an uncollectible inventory or bad inventory or whatever the accountants call it. I'm just gonna throw it away. Well, that's probably not the way, uh, that's probably not the way to do it. So complete, neutral and accurate. And remember, I want to say something here. Remember, the CFA Institute, they do not require us as good financial analysts to become accountants, but they want us to have enough solid information. They want us to have enough breadth and enough depth to be able to think like an accountant. There's a difference between being an accountant and thinking like an accountant. And so what do we want here? We want comparability, we want verifiability, we want timeliness and understandability. So they make perfect sense based on the examples that I've given uh, throughout the slide deck. Uh, how about these constraints? This is what I was saying earlier in Jim's financial reporting. Make trade-offs across enhancing characteristics. Okay, so boy, there is no predetermined set of order of priority among the enhancing characteristic uh, such that some of those characteristics might dominate the other. In, in other words, um, when you put together a financial report, you can't say something like, here are our revenues, look at our revenues. We have tons and tons of revenues up here. And by the way, we're really great at generating revenues. And then somewhere way down on the bottom, you can't put in like three size font. Oh, here are all of our expenses. And oh, by the way, the expenses are greater than the revenues. And so we have a net loss. So look at that, that second embedded bullet point. This is what I was talking earlier balance between the marginal cost and the marginal benefits of providing and using the information. I give lots of examples in these slide decks in the extremes. And this is why I gave the extreme of Jim's anarchy standards and Jim's you have to have every grain of sand 
uh, detail in, in that extreme. Now, here's a big limit down at the bottom. All right, so what do you do about non-quantifiable information? All right, so let's think about a company like, like Coca-Cola. What does Coca-Cola have on its left-hand side of the balance sheet? These are all the assets. I mean, clearly it has short-term, let's call them current assets, but then it has long-term assets, things like land, things like buildings, things like machinery, things like equipment, things like technology, right? So those are quantifiable. But what about the Coca-Cola patent and trademark and all of those legal terms about its molecules for its soda pop, right? So somewhere on that balance sheet, they're going to have this asset that is a, uh, that is uh, a patent or a trademark. Somewhere it's going to have that. And it's going to have some good ways to value that. But how do you assign a value of the human capital, right? The brain power of all of the Coca-Cola, really, really smart men and women who are working on this. And then, you know, we watch television. We play on our phone. We see ads for Coca-Cola, right? What are we having? The greatest of all Coca-Cola. That's the latest one. The greatest of all molecules or formula. So you have creativity and innovation, customer lo loyalty positive corporate culture. Here's another one that's gaining lots and lots of traction. How about risk culture? We need to have every individual who works for Coca-Cola thinking about all of the risks associated with their operations. Super difficult to quantify that. Uh, required reporting elements. All right, we did this in this previous reading, right? Economic characteristics, so elements that are directly related to financial position, assets, liabilities, and equity. Those of you who just watched that one, what did you learn? I said, take out your camera, click. Uh, the balance sheet is a picture of a financial position at any given moment of time. Financial performance is, and I did this, right, a running movie show of the, the uh, business's operations over some time period, and those are revenues and expenses. Yeah, this is probably an important one, a going concern. I tell this to my students all the time. In fact, in today's class uh, this morning, we were talking about the Myron Gordon growth model and the timeline went all the way out to infinity. And you'll learn about the Myron Gordon growth model in a later, in a later, later stock pricing reading. And we go out to an infinite timeline and I look at my students and I say, look, we put an infinite timeline here for a company like Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola is going to be around long after I croak, right? Businesses operate as going concerns, meaning that they have to make decisions uh, based on essentially an infinite timeline, but the reading calls it the foreseeable future. Now, of course, businesses get taken over all the time, so they don't operate until infinity, but how about nearly infinity? I don't really know what that means. And then the accrual concept, uh, this has to reflect the economic nature of the transaction. And to understand accruals, I always tell students, and I say this to candidates all the time, that just think about uh, generating revenues. So what can happen? If I'm the Honeycrisp apple farmer, I can sell the apples to you. And if you pay me cash, well, clearly I generated revenues. But if you paid me in an accounts receivable. If you said, you know what, Jim, I'll pay you next week. Well, I gave you, I sold you the apples and you just gave me a little piece of paper that says, I'm going to pay you next week. Should I report that as revenue? Well, clearly, according to all the standards that we've talked about so far today, the answer is yes. But with the accrual concept, we have to be painfully aware that you who bought those Honeycrisp apples from me on credit, I mean, that's a, essentially what an accounts receivable is, you, you might decide not to pay me. So then we got to go back and unaccrual that transaction, undereveneize that. I'm not sure that's a word, but accrual concept. So not necessarily when cash in the transaction occurs. Now, recognition occurs when the item is included on the balance sheet or the income statement. So that's what I just described uh, with the Honeycrisp apples. But let me give you a different example. Let's suppose that I'm Jim's construction company and you've hired me to build a bridge uh, from one of your campuses to another. And so let's suppose for some crazy reason, 
some crazy reason that this bridge is going to cost $50 million and you pay me up front. You pay me $50 million today before I do any work. Well, what do I have to do? I mean, I have to recognize that as a liability. I still owe you that money because I haven't done anything. I don't want to recognize it as revenue because that would be completely misleading. So I'm going to recognize it on the balance sheet as a liability, and I'm not going to recognize it on the income statement as revenue. And so the standards are going to help me determine what's the most, what were some of those words we learned earlier? Transparent, reasonable, accurate, all that kind of stuff. All right, how do we measure these financial elements. And so I'm going to ask you to just go back to your own personal balance sheet, right? So I'm just guessing that many of you own a house. So if you put together your personal balance sheet, you'd have to assign a value. Once again, we get back to that word, monetary amounts in bold in the slide. What kind of a value are you going to assign your house? Well, you could have the historical cost, right? What you paid for your house. But if you're like uh, my parents, when, when my father passed away three years ago, um, he could have carried the value of his house at what he paid for it. And my mother was so proud. She always used to say, you know, Jimmy, in 1965, when you were four years old, we paid $15,000 for this house. It was a beautiful house in 1965. That would be the historical cost. But then when my father passed away, he doesn't make any sense to say, okay, this is the value of his asset. We probably want to put it at its current cost. Maybe it's market value, which was, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. That makes a lot of sense. And then somewhere in the middle, we could take the amortized cost. We could consider things like, well, depreciation for, you know, a physical asset. If it's a financial asset, we can amortize it. Um, if it's uh, something like oil or gold, we can deplete it. And then we have this concept of impairment, which we'll talk about in a later slide deck. So remember those three, historical cost, amortized cost, or current costs. Now, what we can also do is we can have this as a realizable value if, if we're going to sell it. And of course, when my father passed away, my sister and I, we inherited the house and neither one of us wanted to live in that house. And so we sold it. And so what we could have done is that current cost of replacement, that might have been a market value, but it might not have been. But clearly the realizable value was going to be a market value. Now, my sister and I, we could have rented that house out and we could have said, you know what? Somebody could come here and sign a 50 year lease and a thousand dollars a month. So we could have taken the present value of that and we could have reported it as a present value. And we'll learn all about present values and uh, our financial calculator uh, at some later slide deck. And then sometimes accountants and financial analysts think of an exit price. Uh, fair value. And so that would probably apply to my dad's house as well. All right. A practical example illustrating the need for a conceptual framework. And I said this a little bit earlier. I used the, the, uh, the example of Enron. And this is what we know about Enron. Enron had a balance sheet. Then Enron being an energy company on its balance sheet, it had a lot of stuff that you would think an energy company would have. You know, it had land and it had buildings and it had drills and machinery, uh, and it had natural gas and oil under the ground. They, they make lots of sense. But over the years, Enron, in its management of the price risk associated with uh, removing oil and natural gas from underground, realized that, you know, price of oil goes up and down. And so they used derivative securities to hedge that risk. And what it learned over time is that it became more profitable and it was a lot easier. I mean, think about, it. you know, Enron was in Houston, in Texas. Those of you who don't live in the United States know that every day in Texas, it's 300 degrees outside. So Enron had the choice. Do you want to go out and dig or do you want to use derivative securities to hedge inside our air conditioned room? And so Enron, they use derivatives all the time. They started making a ton of money, but then when they lost a ton of money, they decided to, what's the right word? How about, I'll just say it this way. This is the nice way to say it. Massage, uh, maybe manipulate is a better word, the, uh, all the assets on their balance sheet. 
And so look at the example, look at the arrow points. So they used off balance sheet arrangements. Oh my gosh, we're gonna learn all about that. Probably not till level two, but this is really a cool thing to avoid transparent reporting. Uh, and that was, uh, that was really good stuff. It was really uh, an awful lesson for the shareholders and the workers of Enron to learn, but it was a great lesson for all of us outside looking in and saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly why we need all of these standards, all of these constraints on financial reporting. Now, that, of course, was my Jim's uh, opinion on the Enron. That, uh, none of that stuff will ever be tested on the CFA exam. Uh, so to restore public confidence, many advocate a move toward principle-based rules. Oh boy, there's a lot embedded in that in that concept. However, you know the problem with Enron is that it was it was paying its uh, its accounting firm to do its accounting, and it oh it was also paying its accounting firm to uh, advise it on its derivative contracts, and so there was a clear conflict of interest back at Enron. All right, so this uh, international financial reporting standards requires that a complete set of financial statements includes the balance sheet, income statement, changes in equity, and cash flows. Together, together with notes, and I said this to you in the previous recording about the importance of notes because you can't throw everything inside of the balance sheet. You need to explain some of the decisions, and so those are the notes. Uh, general features, I bet we've co covered each one of these during this slide deck. Fair presentation, going concern, accrual, material, aggregation, consistency, offsetting, frequency of reporting. I probably didn't say that, but of course we need to put together, that's why it's called an annual report. That's the big one. But of course, as good financial analysts, we want those quarterly financial statements, even if they're not audited, we want them because we know sooner or later they're going to be audited so that they have, they have tremendous value. All right, so inside of these things, what do we need? Clearly, we know we need to see current assets and non-current assets, current liabilities and non-current liabilities. We need to be able to reconcile schedules and disclosures. Um, boy, look at the second arrow point. Yeah, requirement for reconciliation schedules and disclosures to be provided has been disappearing. And this is for a variety of reasons, none of which I'll talk about here today, but we'll talk about them as we go through uh, each, of the next, uh, each of the next readings. All right, a summary. Like for like comparison is difficult. It's imperative to take into account the divergence. All right, so we've got one set of standards here in the US, one set of standards for the rest of the world. And what did I say? That we're moving towards convergence, but we're probably not ever going to get to that point where those sets of standards are identical. And so at some point, we're going to have to say, okay, if we're looking at financial statements that do it this way, and another set of financial statements that do it a different way, right? They both conform to standards, one US standard, one international standard. We need to go ahead and account for the divergence in those two because this account over here for let's say inventory might be 100 and this one over here might be 300 and you might think, oh my gosh, these people over here have tons of inventory. But when you, when you account for the different standards, maybe 100 and 100 are, are identical. And so that's important to be able to know how to translate those financial statements. Uh, monitoring developments. All right, so this is super important. And I bet you don't need to hear this from me. You know, we need to monitor because we need to ask ourselves the question, okay, are the decisions that we've made in the past, have they been appropriate? And so we go back and say, okay, when you uh, assign a value to inventory, we're asking you to do it this way or this way. And then we go and we see how you've done this over time. And we make a conclusion that, hey, that's reasonable. But then what happens if something changes during that intermediate period? And so look, new products, 
new types of transactions. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of examples in the derivative securities market. I mean, you know, uh, let's go back to the standards in, let's say, 1970, when there was no such thing as a credit default swap. And then when these things started showing up, at least, you know, over the counter somewhere in the late 80s and early 90s, well, how do you report on a value of a credit default swap? And then they become more standardized and more standardized. And now credit default swap market, you know, is, is huge. And so the standard back then is probably not relevant for the standard now because they're new types of financial securities. And then, of course, these governing bodies, they can make changes. I mean, uh, you know, the SEC could come out and say something like, you know what, we want you to report on the number of clouds uh, over your uh, office in Philadelphia every day. I mean, that's a silly one, but uh, and I'm not suggesting that the SEC would do such a thing, but but it can change its standards and its regulations. And then, of course, what we want to do is we want to allow companies to have a great deal of flexibility, because what are we trying to do as good accountants? What the auditors and the accounting firms are trying to do is to put together a set of financial statements that reflect the economics of the business. And so sometimes that flows just naturally, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, you know, you have to pound a square peg into a round hole. And that's why it's important to have flexibility. And that takes us through uh, these learning outcome statements. I'm not going to pick one and say one is more important than the other. But what I will do is I will say something like, you know what? These are big picture items. These lay the groundwork for the more granular conversations that we're going to have in upcoming readings. And let me go ahead and give you another example of a question at the end of the reading. There's a question on one of the international accounting standards. And the question reads something like, which of the following would be a part of this uh, international accounting standards one or whatever the question is. And then the answer choices are some things on the income statement, some things on a balance sheet. And so you'd be able to pick. So I encourage you to take a look at the actual reading and look at the simplicity of these questions at the end of the reading, and that will give you a sense of the generality that I've been trying to convey. We'll do granularity coming, uh, coming up. So as always, thank you for watching. I had fun, uh, and good luck studying.